for the first 40 years of India's history, we were unfree, economically unfree. And you had, if you wanted to start a company or you wanted to have a job, you had to get a license. And you had to bring suitcases of cash to get that license as a bribe, frankly. That's how it was done. Today's condition, we have got much better condition for creating an industrial revolution than we did in 91. Our infrastructure, road mileage has doubled in the country since 2011. Port handling capacity has quadrupled. The digital revolution, meaning people with bank accounts, have gone from 44% to almost 88-89%. I'm uh, absolutely delighted and honored to be discussing uh, Gurcharan Das Ji's book, Another Sort of Freedom. I'd heard a lot about him, I'd read some of his works, and now to be face to face with him is an absolutely wonderful experience. Many of you have already read some of his best selling works, India Unbound the difficulty of being good, the riddle of desire, have all been bestsellers. He also wrote several plays. One, Mira, on the life of Mira Bai, was performed in New York. He wrote it when he was a young man of 22 years old. And then in Mumbai, with great acclamation of uh, critics. I read this book and was enamored by every word, every paragraph, every chapter. It's a memoir. The book is frank, bold, humorous, historical, and with an overriding philosophical tone. So without further ado, Let's hear from uh, Gurcharan himself. You know, the book starts with um, a couple of incidents when you were a little boy of five in undivided India, living in Lyalpur and Lahore. One was an incident with Ayan, your classmate, and the other, uh, an incident with a shocking incident of a Muslim policeman getting killed during the partition. How did that affect your thinking and your philosophy in the years that followed? I've written this book, Another Sort of Freedom, and it is a memoir. And before I answer your question, Ranjit, I, let me just sort of tell, uh, talk about why you should be interested in reading this book. I think one of the reasons is, and I was listening to the Japanese debate, discussion, and for me, they did not mention the most important things that should be talked about. Why should we be interested in Japan and why should Japan be interested in India? The only sensible foreign policy for India should be 8% economic growth. That's when you become a respected nation. That's why China is where it is today. And India is not there at all. And what we could have learned from Japan is how to get 8% growth. We sacrificed the first two generations of our country, independent India, because we chose the wrong economic model. And we chose the wrong economic model. So, and young people like you, your predecessors, lost out. And what I'm trying to say, Japan had the answer. They were the first ones to show that it is the export of labor intensive manufacturers that makes a country successful. And of course, we had a license Raj and we'll talk about it. But I'm just trying to tell you what is important here today to you is that I 
stand out, my life stands out as a, an example of the things that we should, that I broke the mold. In other words, for me, our Azadi came in 1991, not in 1947. And a lot of these people who were sitting here were totally oblivious of what Japan could have really taught us. So let's go back to my life and how is it that one person, what you should be interested in is how I broke the mold of the way things were going. And it really begins, Ranjit, I had my, my mother's diary is really the source of a lot of my recollections when I was a child. He's talking about a five-year-old, what I was at five. My, my mother's diary, the first mention of me is on page 17, where she says, I'm, one, I'm, I'm six months old. She says, this is a restless baby. One year later, in her diary, she's saying, this is a troublesome boy. And in the, a year later, she's calling me a troublemaker. So you can see where I'm headed. And then I'm in school, and this is where we are going to begin, the, what he was talking about. I'm in kindergarten, and my name, by the way, was Ashok Kumar. I'll tell you why the name also got changed. So my name is Ashok Kumar, and I keep asking troublesome questions of the teacher, and her first answer to me is Nahi. And she starts calling me Nahi Kumar, because I'm always giving her a difficult time. Anyway, so let's jump to the story. I'm in kindergarten. We all in kindergarten have pencil boxes. Those pencil boxes, two annas they used to cost, two pencils, one eraser. Everybody, it's a, yeah, and, and everybody in class has a pencil box except the kid who sits next to me. He's poor, he's, he's a Muslim, and his name is Ayan. The kid who sits in front of me, he's a rich kid. He's the richest kid in class. He's the only one who comes in a car. All of us walk to school. And he has two pencil boxes. So at recess, when the teacher goes out and every all the children go out, I go and pick up the pencil box from the rich kid's desk and put it on Ayan's desk. After the recess, everybody returns. The rich kid screams, who stole my pencil box? The teacher gets very worried because he's the richest kid in class. And so she makes us all stand up and everybody goes around uh, saying, no, we don't know, we don't know, until it comes to Ian's turn. And Ian says, yes, there's a pencil box on my desk. It's not mine, and I don't know who put it there. Then it comes my turn. And this is the time when I should have confessed. I, I become frozen. I can't say anything, like temporary insanity. I mean, it is an odd thing. Here, I could have, anyway, Ian is taken to the front of the class. Nobody believes him, and he's punished. And I ask myself, what happened? Here, I was helping this kid, giving him a pencil box, and when it came time, when I could have saved him, I didn't do it. And so this story is linked to what happens 
Four months later, August 1947, India becomes free, but we also have partition. During the partition, Lahore, where we are, the kindergarten, by the way, is in Lahore. <clears throat> I'm a refugee. And we are fleeing for, we are Hindus, and we are fleeing from our, for our lives. <clears throat> because people are killing each other all, the, all day long, cheerfully in the name of religion, killing their neighbors in the name of religion. So it's, we fortunately go through the border safely with our lives. And we are now waiting in, on this platform on Jalandhar, Jalandhar station. We are in a train, my family and I. I'm five years old. And I look out the window and I see a policeman, handsome, tall, holding the piece together. And two sick boys come from behind and they spear him with their kirpans. And he falls down, dead, with blood splattered all over. My mother shuts the window. And I asked, I mean, I'm five, so you don't think much about these things, but it scares you. The reason I'm connecting the two stories is because Ayan's story was one five-year-old who suffered from temporary insanity. And the other is a whole nation, not nation, Punjab, becoming temporarily insane, where they're getting up, cheerfully killing their neighbors, happily in the name of religion. Anyway, both these events scarred me for, for life. And I still had nightmares of iron until a few years ago. Very powerful stories, and I, I'm sure that that uh, informed your thinking and philosophy in the years to come. Uh, this idea of absurdity and insanity that plagues humankind. And then you went off to Washington from that trauma of partition and so on. Your father got transferred to Washington and you got into a school there. So how was it being an Indian boy in a school in America, in Washington, D.C.? What were your experiences there? Well, we, we, I, I went to Washington because uh, my father was transferred. He's an engineer and he was seconded by the Punjab government. They wanted three, the World Bank wanted three Indian engineers to help uh, negotiate the water treaty, Indus Water Treaty. Some of you may have heard about it. It's the one treaty that we signed with Pakistan without any war. And first day, India has got three engineers and Pakistan has sent 125 lawyers. And the first thing the World Bank president says to the Pakistanis, please send your 125 lawyers back, send three engineers, because we are going to give money to both your countries to develop the irrigation in the Indus water area. And we are going to work with maps Lawyers don't understand maps, engineers do. And so, while this is going on, I'm at school. I'm, my mother has taken me to Roosevelt High School. They admit me in class, and my mother quickly realizes that I'm, I've, I, I was in modern school in Delhi. So I'm way ahead of my class. So she goes to plead with the principal and she says to the principal, look, give him a test. He's way ahead of his class. And then you can decide which class to put him in. The principal, and, she, and also she says, if you can't put him in a, an, a higher class, at least put him in a section. You know, it's a class of 200 with five sections. Two sections are college preparatory sections kids who are going to go on to college, 
and three sections are vocational sections kids who will go and go and work in factory afterwards so white collar blue collar they have differentiated us at the beginning and they have put me in the vocational section so she's at least put him in the college prep section anyway he is a southern redneck the vice the, the, the deputy principal and he looks at the color of my skin and he says welcome to america son in our country colored boys not supposed to get too big for their boots and so you stay out of trouble in 4 years you'll get a diploma and that diploma will get you a factory job so welcome to the american dream and my mother is devastated this is the first immediate first example of racism that we are confronted with and um a few days later i go to a class which is called shop and shop means that we learn carpentry we learn to work with our hands how to fix a radio all very useful things uh and when my mother hears that what i'm doing she's again horrified she says that in back home people like us don't do those things what she is trying to tell me is that we are upper caste now when you in a, in a punjabi family which i grew up in you're shielded especially punjab because it's a broader province caste is not in your face and so she uh, is telling me that you know we are upper caste and what are you doing things that are what obcs would be doing back home and so i discovered caste in india through racism in america but there's a happier side to the story a few months later there is a birthday party a white girl in our class has a birthday party she has a she has liberal parents so she's allowed to invite white kids and black kids and i get invited it's my first birthday party in america and we have lots of eats and i love it and then we play a game called spin the bottle i don't know if any of you have heard of this game but you sit around in a circle and you spin a bottle and where the bottle stops and where the mouth of the bottle points to you are allowed to kiss the girl of the opposite sex at that point and so i see them the unwritten rule unwritten rule of this game on that day was that black boys kissed only black girls and white boys kissed only white girls so when it came my turn everybody got confused what is he going to do and i through a brilliant stroke of nahi kumar i go and kiss every girl i kiss black girls i kiss white girls and as a result i kept getting bonus turns and i kissed and i kissed all evening and i loved it so that's a lovely uh, lovely story <laughs> so then uh, you went to that school but then your cv says you went off to harvard so after doing those sort of backward type of classes how did you make it and what I land up at harvard before that just let me say one more thing that and this is related to what i talked about japan also that i discovered that you know i wanted i love i mean i discovered the movies it used to cost 75 cents to go to a movie sorry 25 cents but my mother didn't have it and she wouldn't give it to me so i got a i got a job distributing newspapers in the morning 
You know, paper boy. I became a pa- Washington Post. I used to distribute and earn money. But I just want to say that this experience of shop and distributing the Washington Post in the morning gave me a sense of work and self self confidence it was not all learning as the way we think of school is all learning in the mind it was practical and that gave me another perspective which i would never have got in india anyway to answer your question 4 years later i graduated i graduated at the top of my class and i got scholarships to harvard princeton and yale and nobody in that school had done that for a long time so the same guy who had this dr- american dream for me calls me into his office and he is reading the morning paper because my, my picture is there on page 5 of the washington boys boy from india you know does well or something and uh, he says you made us proud son and uh, uh, you achieved the american dream and i wanted to remind him that his idea of the american dream was a very racist idea but i was too decent to do so <laughs> So so what did you then study at Harvard I mean like uh, after that amazing performance in school and breaking records you're in Harvard now you got everybody who's amazing there So I'm so the next moment I take you to I'm this is I, I'm back home in India for the summer my parents are back Indus Water Treaty has been settled I mean it's a great achievement and we are at Palam Airport in Delhi Air India flight is waiting my mother has tears in her eyes saying goodbye to her son and she is telling me now listen you have to make a living one day study something useful at harvard why don't you be an engineer like your father india always needs engineers you'll get a job so my father is standing a little bit at a distance but he hears this and he also tells my uh, tells us look he has t- tells my mother look he is also going to make a life so don't just worry about making a living and so i arrive at harvard and i promptly forget my mother's advice when i discover the course catalog and it's a treasure treasure chest and what do i do i mean it offers the lovely thing about the american undergraduate education still is that you can take anything you want for the first two years you don't have to be arts commerce science none of that and so what do i study talking about taking doing something useful i do everything useless i study i take a course in greek tragedy Russian novel history of capitalism plato and aristotle renaissance painting chinese ceramics uh, bauhaus architecture and sanskrit love poetry the greatest sanskrit scholar is there at harvard teaching sanskrit and when my mother hears that i am studying sanskrit at harvard she says hi hi mera munda dead language only the dead now will give him a job and so by the third year even harvard is a little concerned that i'm flitting from flower to flower like a honey bee and so the dean calls me in and he says son you got to have a major and takes minimum courses and write a thesis so he says now declare a major and so what will it be and i think uh, i say philosophy i had a very good course with on plato and aristotle and so i say philosophy and he says why and i said happiness 
I want to be happy. He says, that's a good reason to study philosophy, but it's the most original one that I've heard, and so I did philosophy. And I graduated in philosophy from, from Harvard. After flitting about in Harvard, all these different courses and all that, how did this philosophy major, who had also done ceramics and Sanskrit love poetry, come back to India and start selling wicks? Wicks good, drops. Good question. I finish in philosophy. I get a scholarship to do a PhD at Oxford. And uh, those of you who may know phil philosophy at all, my tutor was John Rawls. And if you've heard of him, you know how lucky, lucky I was. And the person who invited me to Oxford to study was Isaiah Berlin. Anyway, so I'm back in Chandigarh, and I'm going to go off to Oxford in a few months. And I ask myself, do I really want to spend the rest of my life at that stratosphere of abstract thought? No, I said, I want a life of action. I don't know what that life is, but that's what I say to myself. And I write quietly without telling my parents to Oxford that I'm not coming. And my mother's worst nightmare has come true. She has a grown-up, unemployed son at home. And we have a nosy neighbor who comes to visit my mother for coffee in the mornings. And she asks her, Thoda munda ki kar rea? And my mother gets embarrassed and she says, Menu ni pata. And I see this embarrassment on her face and I feel sorry for her. So I answer the first advertisement I find in the newspaper. There's a company that makes Wicks Vapor Rub and they want trainees. Now I don't know what a trainee is, but they call. So I apply to the job and they call me for an interview. And at the interview, the interviewer asks me, uh, what is your objective in life? And uh, so I say happiness. And he says, wrong answer. I meant, uh, would you like to go into finance? marketing, production, and I said, uh, uh, and while I'm thinking, a stunning girl walks in with tea and coffee. She's maybe his secretary, and she places, and my attention is totally diverted. And I watch her, and she puts tea and coffee on the t table, and then she goes out. And my eyes go back, back to this guy who's interviewing me. And he says, Acha, so you want to be happy. What will make you happy? I said, a beautiful woman. Again, the guy is stupefied. What guy? He says, what kind of a person has come to me for this interview? Anyway, the long and short of it is very quickly I realize I've made a mess of this interview. But two days later, I got get a letter saying they've taken me on. So that's how I joined Vicks Vapor Rub. And that's how I was transported from the ivy-covered halls at Harvard to the dusty bazaars of India, carrying a bag, talking to chemists, chemists one free, one dozen. How many dozens do you want? Well, you know, uh, the uh, job may have been, you know, just selling wicks and all that. But in those days, these sort of jobs were prestigious. You know, you were in a multinational company and, you know, good salary and all that kind of thing. But anyway, so you joined this multinational and uh, you were making big bucks for your company. And it was at that time when you experienced this proverbial license Raj, this very strict 
economic control, you know, the sort of Soviet model that uh, had been adopted in India. So what was your experience with that? Because I know that formed your later thinking and your books and your articles. I used to read them in Times of India. It was all about liberalization because of the uh, draconian license Raj. So did you have any experience? I think you've uh, mentioned something. You're lucky. You're lucky what for the first 40 years of India's history, we were unfree, economically unfree. And you had, if you wanted to start a company or you wanted to have a job, you had to get a license. And you had to bring suitcases of cash to get that license as a bribe, frankly. That's how it was done. And our license for my company <clears throat> specified how many tons of Vicks vapor up that we could make in a year. And so there was a flu. There was a flu in the country, and we sold a hell of a lot of Vicks. We ended up selling in the whole, you know, Vicks was sold in 135 countries, made by an American company, actually. We were celebrating. We had had a great year, record profits, record sales. And also we were feeling good because there had been an epidemic and we had helped millions of children during this epidemic with a product that they could use and allayed mothers' anxieties about their children. And that day we are celebrating the company lawyer gives me a summons which has come from Delhi. And the summons asks us to explain that we've broken the law and they want me to appear. So I go with two lawyers, I go to Delhi and the official, the joint secretary in the government who has called me he keeps us waiting for two hours, and then he calls us in, and he's reading the newspaper. And we sit down, and he's still reading the newspaper. And finally, he decides to put his newspaper down, and he says, Kya? And I said, look, sir, you have given us this summons, so I should ask you, Kya? And then he, he doesn't like my answer. And so I explained to him that this, there was an epidemic in the country. We did our duty to keep the store sh stocks in the s pharmacies and chemist shops stocked with our product. And, and this was the result why we exceeded our licensed capacity. And he thunders back but you broke the law. I said, yes, but I thought we were doing something good, producing for the country. And he's, I think he must have been a real leftist, or he hated business. He said, look, you guys in business, in uh, private sector, you're all crooks. And I want to, especially in multinational companies, and I want to make an example of you, of your company. So now the law will take its own course. So Jao. So he wants us to leave. And at the door, at the door, you know, I turn around. And I don't know what got into me. Maybe it's that Nahi Kumar. And I say to him, sir, you know, the news is going to leak out. It's going to leak out and it will appear an American multinational and it will appear in New York Times, Washington Post, at London and Times of India. And it will say that you, it's not every day that a multinational executive goes to jail. So the story will be that here 
was a company, there was a flu in the uh, epidemic, and this company produced something that was useful for the people. And for that, the, com gov the country has rewarded this person. The government has sent him to jail. How do you think our country is going to look in the eyes of the world? How do you think our prime minister, this Indira Gandhi was the prime minister, how do you think our prime minister is going to look? And I'll say, how do you think you will look? Who's recommending sending me to jail for three years? It was a three-year sentence, by the way. But the government had the discretion to reduce it. But this guy is not. And then he says, are you threatening me? I said, no. I'm just telling you that I won't leak out the information, but it'll come out. And doesn't, don't you think that this is a lunatic law that has this kind of consequence? What kind of, what kind of government are we living in? He says, Jao. And so I go out and the lawyers are shivering and they are angry with me. They said, you should, have, you should have begged for mercy at his feet. And what did you do? You were defying him? Anyway, I was scared. I had sleepless nights after that. But the government quietly dropped the inquiry. They must have, somebody must have seen what a stupid thing this was. But the point of my story is, again, to remind you that why this discussion, the only sensible subject that I would have asked the question in the last session was, why didn't we, why didn't we follow the Japanese model? Korea followed it, Taiwan followed it, Hong Kong, Singapore, East, China has followed it now. That's how China has made such a big success. And China is where it is, China. I mean, I don't think Indians want to live in, in that, with that kind of government. But that was the only thing. And somehow, we lived for 40 years under the most lunatic, it's it's really, I talked about temporary insanity. This temporary insanity was lasted for 40 years, from 1950 to 1991. And that's the significance, frankly, of your coming to this session, to know how lucky you are that you don't have to live through this way. A uh, very compelling argument uh, for liberalization, which finally came under Narsimha Rao and Manmohan Singh, which you mentioned in your book. Anyway, so, you know, there's one person, uh, now before I shift into you as a writer, there's one person who keeps popping in and out of your story. He's somebody who was insignificant, and I'm specially asking this because of all these wonderful young students here. I'm reminded of my days in St. Stephen's College when we didn't have lit fests, but we used to have debates and all sorts of things. Um, Shashi Tharoor, Sapan Das Gupta, all these guys were my seniors. So for you all, what makes a difference in life? And there's this man that keeps popping in and out of your book, insignificant, and yet the kind of people who make India. His name is Kamble. Who is this Kamble? Mm. I'm so glad you asked. Kamble, I was working at VIX. By now, by, by the way, it had become Procter and Gamble. It company had bought that company worldwide. What was Richardson Hindustan or Richardson VIX worldwide. And I'm the head of the company now. And this guy comes in as an assistant security guard in our company. And Kamble was a real Dehati, came from Akola district, metric pass, first time in the city of Bombay. He's like a child who's come to the city for the first time, hasn't seen lights the way, you know, the hoarding signs, etc., billboards. And 
he is discovers the coffee making machine in our office and he's so fascinated by it that next day he's making coffee and serving it to everybody just to see how it feels to make coffee from a coffee making machine two days later he discovers the telex machine those days we sent telex messages to each other uh, before email and all that and he doesn't know english so he says i must learn english and uh, by the way his he can't pronounce Procter and Gamble, the name of the company. He calls it Procter and Gamble. <laughs> and, but he is amazing. He has that infectious thing. One is that sort of hunger and sort of the childlike child in him. And in a, in a few weeks' time or a few months' time, if you have a problem in the, his evening shift, so if you have a problem in the evening shift in the company, you say, ask Kamble, and he has the answer. And so after uh, eight, nine months uh, in the company, our telephone operator goes on maternity leave. She's having a baby. And so Kamble goes to the head of personnel, now called HRD, and she, he asks him, Look, uh, I'm tired of working at night. Let me be your temporary telephone operator. And the head of HRD says, Kamle, we are a multinational company. We get calls from around the world. And you can't even pronounce the name of the company properly. How can we make you our telephone operator? And poor Kamle goes away with a long face. And then I hear about it in the, through the grapevine. And I go and tell HRD guy, I said, give him a chance, uh, have a backup ready. In a few days, if he doesn't work out, you know, we have, we'll have somebody to do the job. And uh, so Kamble becomes a telephone operator. And a few days later, I meet our company lawyer. And he says, uh, Gurcharan, have you got a new EPBX system? I said, no. He says, well, you know, your calls, my calls are answered promptly on the second ring. Whereas before, I would have to wait till fourth, fifth, sixth ring. And, and this is, I thought, this is very efficient. And so I, I think to myself, our EPBX, EPBX system is Kamble. So I go to the uh, Kamble and I said, Kamble, why do you answer the phone so quickly? And he gave me the answer that totally floored me. He says, there may be a customer at the other end. And I don't want us to lose an order. My God, even the marketing director of the company couldn't have given such a good answer. Anyway, so this goes on, he becomes a telephone. You see, we immediately know that this guy is different. Not only is he, I can tell you 100 stories, there's no time, read the book. But there is a quality about him which is different from everyone else. And that's why he keeps getting promoted. We, we, he's absorbed out of security. He gets, keeps getting jobs. And every six months, every year, he gets promoted to a new job. And why? Because he's the only person who doesn't care who gets the credit for what has been achieved. Every section where he works becomes a high-performing section. And he, he's so happy to come to work that he'll pay us. We would have paid us to come to work, frankly. He was that kind of guy. Anyway, the ending of the story, I, I won't take long, is that he retired as a director of the company. A guy who started like that. So it's an inspiring story. For me, I was the head of the company. He was an assistant security guard. But I learned everything 
He was my mentor. And I learned everything from Kamle. Fantastic. So some people are doers who don't take credit. Some people sit back and take all the credit. That's what you're trying to say. And those who are the doers reach the top. And they, they, get, they don't need the credit from, you know, they don't have to claim it. They get it because people see their good work. Now, I want to shift now to your book and your writing. Sorry, not your book, but your writing. How come a, a businessman, a CEO of a multinational, is a writer and went into writing? A few years after I joined the business world, I quickly realized I missed the intellectual life. You know, after all, I'd been doing philosophy and those things, and suddenly I'm transported to the dusty bazaars of India. And so my father is the one who suggested, one who talks about making a life. There's this theme running in the book, my mother's influence making a living, my father's making a life. And he was the one who reassured my mother that he was making a life through books. And so he suggested that you have the weekend. Why don't you do something else, have a hobby or, uh, you know, and that's how one morning, frankly, I decided I was in uh, some small town in some Sri Krishna lodge on a weekend. And I said, I'm going to write a play. And then I say to myself, well, it must have been a morning like this when Shakespeare too sat down to write Hamlet. So this is nothing new. How I old were you it. then? Huh? How old were you then? I was 22. I was 20. I started at 20. So I was 22. And so I wrote a play. There was a competition, luckily. A lot of money, by the way. 10,000 rupees in those days was a was, you know, lakhs of rupees of today. And all the big names, Kushwan Singh, Santa Rama Rao, all these people wrote, but I won the prize. Anyway, so then I wrote a play on Meera, Meera Bai. It was called Meera. And I was, by then, my company had transferred me to New York. So I wrote it again on weekend. My friends played golf. I wrote on weekends. And... So I'm trying to sell this play to some uh, theater, and one theater takes it on, La Mama Theater. They, they took on experimental new ideas and new things. And so <clears throat> the director sets Meera Bhajans to hard rock music, and it's a great success. And, you know, big review from the New York Times and the... The, the, these people thought they're getting some strange guy from India who's writing about a saint and all that, and it's a hard rock music now, and it's a success. Anyway, that's how I got started. Then there was another play called Nine Jaku Hill, which you may have seen in Delhi because it had many, Yatrik did many shows. So that's how I got started, weekend writer. So I, I wore two hats. And then when I was in my 40s, meaning Monday to Friday hat, I was a corporate executive and weekend hat as a writer. And so um, in my 40s, late 40s, I'm at the world headquarters now. The company has, uh, this is just after the reforms, 91 reforms, which I have already told you how I thought that was real Azadi for our country, real hope for the people. And I'm at the world headquarters, managing director of Procter & Gamble worldwide, responsible for world strategy. And it's a, and I'm going to the, in my car, I turn on the radio and the NPR radio station is saying, that the reforms in India are in trouble. And they're in trouble because the Congress party is turning against Narsimha Rao, and the left wing of the Congress party, which is the most articulate, most powerful wing, is against the reforms, and they think India is sold out. 
to the market, to capitalism, all the horrible things that suggests. And I get very worried. And I'm going into a meeting, a global meeting of executives who manage pampers in different countries. And so these executives are, uh, I've called the meeting and all of them are talking about, you know, this improvement is needed in Belgium, this improvement is needed in Africa, etc., etc. And I'm saying to myself, what the hell am I doing thinking about pampers when the country is in this terrible situation where the reforms might get reversed. So the absurd, again, absurdity, uh, absurdity that iron faced, I faced with iron, absurdity at partition, absurdity of the license Raj, another absurdity hits me. And I say, I got to go. This is enough is enough. I shoot off a telegram to Manmohan Singh. Luckily, I had met him when he was a junior guy in finance ministry before uh, in, in the 90s, in the 80s. And um, he of surprisingly answers. I'm, I shot off a telegram saying, I said, why the hell are you guys not selling the reforms? You know, Margaret Thatcher used to say, that I spend 20% of my time doing the reforms and 80% selling them. Why she have to, you have to sell the market. And why? Because it's hard to understand that people, millions of people working in their own self-interest ultimately result in the good of the whole society. It's not, and Adam Smith called it an invisible hand. Those of you who have studied economics know about all this. But for the ordinary person, it's very hard to understand. Because the left says, oh, these are profiteers. You know, like that guy who was talking about the private sector. The businessman, bad guy. Anyway, uh, Manmohan Singh's answer is, come back. You come and sell the reforms. And by then, I've been writing, so I'm, I have the confidence. I've written a novel also. Uh, a fine family, a partition novel, which has done well, which is, by the way, selling even right now. And Sham Benegal wanted to make a film of it, you know, but uh, he never got back financial money backing for it. But now Netflix is interested. So you might see it on Netflix in a few months or a few years. And um, anyway, so... Uh, I went to my wife and I said, look, you know, uh, I, I, we, let's go home. And, and she says, what? You're at the peak of your career, 15 years more, uh, and we could make millions, and, and you want to quit? And so I said, we got enough savings. She's a good sport. I come back, and, uh, and I write a few articles for Times, Times loves them, they give me a column. So weekly, Sundays, I start writing, uh, and mostly columns defending the reforms, defending the market, etc. But out of that comes the first book, which was India Un Unbound. First book that predicted the rise of India. That's, that's fantastic. You know, um, the tyranny of time is calling. Um, so I think we'll open it up to some questions. I'm yeah. sure, uh, you know, these bright young minds here have all sorts of questions about writing and lib liberalization and socialism, whatever. Any questions from the audience? Hi, sir. Uh, it was really nice uh, listening to you. I'm a student of Sri Venkateshwara College, pursuing history honors. Uh, now, you ref you've referred to the period of license Raj as complete lunaticism, right? I would like to hear your views on the lunaticism that has ensued after the LPG reforms. Now you see, uh, the Gini coefficient increased substantially in the urban areas. But the increase in the Gini coefficient in the rural area areas was not much. Now, there was collapse of public health system, education system, and as you've referred to as the invisible hand uh, 
proposed by and theorized by Adam Smith, which was a naive interpretation because invisible hand never worked in capitalism. There are splendid hegemonies today. The Dalits, the Adivasis, the minorities, they have no access to education system, uh, public health system. They cannot afford pri private schools and private uh, health care. Also, the fact uh, that uh, there is one percent of the world holds half of the wealth in the world. You've got Hasdeo, uh, the Adivasi forests, which are being held by Adani, are being destroyed. And then there, the, there were the killings in Nagar whole district. Okay, got it. Love the question. I guess you'd like us to go back to the pre-91 period because it was post-91 that we really became a capitalist economy. And I'd just like to tell you, and you can go back and look at the statistics, that the poor of India between 1950 and 1991 Hardly any difference was made to people to climb the poverty line. Between 1991, this is the Suresh Tendulkar poverty line, 450 million people have risen out of poverty post-91. Secondly, before 91, the middle class was 9% of India. On the same parameter, today it is 32% of, of India. Now, we haven't done as well as China. China lifted 650, 700 million people are out of poverty. And China's middle class is now 60% compared to our 32%. But both countries have done it through the market. And you're right that the soft underbelly, the soft, hi Sanjeev, the soft underbelly of capitalism is inequality. But you should look at inequality from the perspective of, you know, a person who is poor, he doesn't compare himself to Ambani or Adani. That person compares himself to his father or to his neighbors. And if you, if you are rising out of poverty, why worry if somebody gets rich in the process who's creating all these jobs? Now, I'll tell you, our, the growth today in the last 30 years from 91 to 2021 is 30 years. The growth rate of our country has been 6.8% annual growth, real growth, net of inflation. Compared to that, pre, actually the numbers I have are pre-85, 1950 to 1985, our growth rate was 3.5%. And our population growth rate was 2.2. And that was what we moaned and groaned was the Hindu rate of growth. It had nothing to do with being Hindu. It had everything to, be, everything to do with having a command economy. So my point is, yes, this model, and I'm so glad you asked this question, this model that we followed has had one weakness. And that is that we have not been able to create the jobs commensurate with 6.8% annual growth. And this is because we haven't created an industrial revolution. We seem to have skipped from a green revolution to an IT revolution. But all the countries did it in between. My point is that we Today's condition, we have got much better condition for creating an industrial revolution than we did in 91. Our infrastructure, road mileage has doubled in the country since 2011. Port handling capacity has quadrupled. The digital revolution, meaning people with bank accounts, have gone from 44% to almost 88, 89%.
And so I could give you statistics like these. And we are, the GST, we are now one country. So the job of the leader who will win in 2024 is cut out. We still have to create an industrial revolution. I'd like to believe that my friend Raghuram Rajan feels that we don't need it. We could do it, skip to do another level of a digital kind of revolution. But I think we do. And that can be done. And I would say don't look only at equality, inequality. Look at opportunity. I wish there was a real measure of, of opportunity in the country. Opportunity is another word for jobs. Thank you so much, Gurcharan, for um, introducing your book to us and the pearls of wisdom and philosophy and economics and history and international affairs there. Uh, it was a joy for me to read it and now to hear from you. So thank you very much. Let me just say one thing. You know, I'll tell you a little secret. When you write a memoir, you have to relive your life. And I've discovered that reliving your life is actually better than living it. And why? Because you can play God. You know, the difference between autobiography and a memoir is autobiography says I was born here, then I was went to school there, and then I went there. A boring account of your life. Memoir, you, there's a theme. You discover a theme. And then you connect the dots on that theme. It's, 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 it's all facts. I'm not saying you're inventing uh, things. But the reality is, of course, there is the risk. You always want to make look good. Now, if you look too good, the reader will say the pompous ass. But if you do the opposite and say all the bad things about yourself, he says a loser. Why should I read him? So be yourself. And all of you, I recommend write a diary and write a memoir in your life.